around the world, um, increasingly, they're using neurotechnology to do things like interrogation of a criminal suspect. So um, requiring that a person wear an EEG headset and then doing things like testing to see whether there's a pre-conscious recognition of an image. So showing person a uh, person a crime scene detail and while they have an EEG headset on and then measuring their automatic reaction or automatic recognition of that crime scene detail. And that is, um, you know, that's already led to criminal convictions in countries like India of people uh, based on what their brain data reveals. Yes, it's it's just concerning that on the one hand, we have this argument of, you know, since I think 9-11, we had this argument that we have to strengthen our security, right? And one of the, I'm I'm going to not make justice to, to your exact words here, but you said that there is a, how can we truly, uh, you know, how can we truly choose to track all of the people's brains, for example, just to try to prevent one single very random terrorist attack that will probably never happen? And so here's like the, the cost benefit analysis in terms of, you know, do we want us as individuals to be tracked all the time just to prevent one thing? But of course, that one thing can be very ca catastrophic. So it's a very nuanced conversation, but one that it's just weird to think that it's now <laughs> we're talking about it in terms of our brains, that we some companies might have more insights into who Alex is versus me, you know, and, and th this is just through, through the techniques. For example, I, you mentioned my headphones. I don't use the AirPods because of the Bluetooth thing. I don't <laughs> I've heard I read a, a, a thing or two about those not being a good thing. But in today's society, now with Neurotech Professor, where does free will stand on? You know, because you also touch on manipulation and also marketing techniques. I hosted Moran Serif. You mentioned him on, on your book, and he says that, you know, for example, when you touch on the Avatar, Avatar movie, they were using these neuro uh, marketing campaigns to define what trailer is best for them. To, yeah. to sell it. So how do I know if I'm truly making the the choice by myself in a world where just this is just I don't even know if I'm seeing the trailer that touches the best aspects of myself or the one that's just best marketed to my brain? It's the hardest question, right, Alex, which is um, we have a, a, a robust sense of free will. But to what extent is that real or just entirely entirely illusory? If you look at um, the way, you know, most digital technologies are designed, like you think you launch uh, a website like, a, you know, a social media company in order to, um, you know, peruse what your friends are doing, um, you end up spending hours on it instead of, you know, the minutes that you expected to spend on it. Are you making that choice? Are you being driven to make that choice? Um, do you really believe that? Like, do you believe that you don't have free will? So you started with this question of like, what does it mean for a criminal defendant to come into the courtroom and say, my brain made me do it? Right. Right. In many ways, our brains, like the right way to think about it is your brain makes you do everything that you do. And the external environment is increasingly puppeteering us to respond. But it always has been, right? If you go to the checkout counter at your favorite store you know, marketers have long studied what are you most likely to purchase at the last minute if they place it next to the counter? Um, maybe you forgot that you need batteries at home. So they have some, you know, AA batteries next to there. Or maybe what they have found is that, um, you know, the thing that people always forget to buy is a hammer. And so they have hammers, right? It's random. It's not like it's all candy next to the checkout counter. It's the things that have been studied mm that lead you to purchase impulsively at the last minute. Our environment, people are studying all the time how to manipulate our environment to drive and, and shape our choices. Um, so the way I think about it is, yeah, a lot of our choices are constrained, but there's still a space of freedom of action. And the way we know that is, you know, there's lots of things I can put in front of you. Like I'm a chronic migrainer. Um, you know, I love sugar. I love chocolate, but I know chocolate will trigger a migraine for me. I know consequences. And so when I'm presented with chocolate, 
you know, yes, I have all of these things I don't have control over. Like I like sugar. I love chocolate. I have migraines. They're conflicting and I still have to make an action choice. Do I reach out and pick up the chocolate and eat it? Or do I not reach out and pick up the chocolate and eat it? And nine times out of 10, I do not reach out and pick up the chocolate and eat it because I've decided that in weighing those consequences and in having the flexibility of my action choice that I'm not going to do so. But there's tons of constraints that went into that choice, right? And so if we think we're fully free living on an island, we're not. But freedom of action is enough from my perspective for us to be considered free. And when freedom of action is overridden, right? So if somebody literally is puppeteering you, stimulating your action choices, or addicting you to the point where you can no longer make action choices, then I think in the sense that we are free, our freedom has been constrained.